excuse me. Well, as I've just mentioned, we've already looked or actually read the text, so I'm just going to deal this morning with two things, and that is creation and the fact that we are created by God, and we have that great privilege of being made in His image. So we're going to be focusing perhaps um, on Genesis 1, verses 26 and 20. I won't read it again now. I will read it later when we get to it. And I think first part of the sermon is going to be dealing with uh, the rest of the text, which is the creation in general. And again, what that means, why it's important that we understand that, that we are not eternal, we are, we are not our own cause, we didn't make ourselves. As the uh, psalmist uh, says, uh, well, one of the psalmists, I think it's Psalm 100, says, um, uh, you know, it is the Lord who made us and not we ourselves. We didn't make ourselves. He made us. We are His people. We are the sheep of His pasture. And we are accountable to Him. Well, just first by way of review, remember the Lord told us through Jude that He wants us to stand up for the faith. In other words, to, to fight for the truth. Now, He wants us to do this as we saw for two reasons. First, because the truth is continually under attack. It's under attack by the world because those of the world hate the truth. Now again, just consider the struggle we have with it and consider the world doesn't even have the Spirit of God. They have no desire for it. As long as they look at it as a piece of literature, they might pick it up and read it. They might have some interest in it. But as soon as they see it to be what it really is, the Word of God, and see what it says about them and their future, they are not going to like it. And that's because they are averse to God. They're spiritually dead. They do not have God's Spirit. They have no love for God. They have no love for His truth. That's the reason why they do what they do. Now that is what the fall did to us. And that's what we're going to be looking at more this evening. Now, of course, the devil is also at work in the world, deceiving the world, giving the world reasons to reject the truth, such as God doesn't exist, atheism. And because he doesn't exist, we have another way to explain how we actually came about, which is evolution. We're just a cosmic accident. Matter is eternal, or maybe it started at some point in time, there was nothing, then boom, there was everything somehow organized itself into a universe and somehow on this particular planet matter organized itself into all this variety of life. So they choose to believe this and the reason is because the devil wants them to live with a clear conscience, to not know they're in danger until it's too late and there's nothing they can do. But that has consequences for us. So we need to be ready to defend the faith to those outside the church. But secondly, remember the devil also attacks the truth within the church, in the evangelical church. Truth is compromised continually for the sake of numbers. You know, what can we do to make it more entertaining so that more and more people will come? Well, one of the things we have to do is get rid of some of the truth because the truth is not desirable. It's not entertaining. It's very convicting. Uh, well, miracles, you know, are, are sold as well as uh, the promise of victory for the sake of money. Again, for the sake of numbers. And even in many evangelical churches, even the sincere really are suffering because they're just not being taught well. Because their ministers did not learn what they needed to learn and that's, again, another attack of the enemy that has weakened the church through the years. So the enemy is attacking the church, the evangelical church. And as we saw before, virtually every major cult started somehow connected to the church. The Gnostic influence, Docetism, the idea that Jesus only appeared to be a man, but he wasn't really a man and so forth. It was an early Christian heresy. It was in the church. Islam was started by Muhammad who came in contact with a Christian monk who happened to be, I believe, a Docetist and a Gnostic as well. And so Islam formed from that. Roman Catholicism is essentially the historical church holding on to a number of errors throughout the years that Satan planted in the church, and it's actually lost the gospel.
Now, why does that happen every time they, they are outside the church? You ever ask yourself that question? They, they gun it right here. Do you ever notice that? So again, uh, attacks, attacks of the enemy. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses, Charles Taze Russell, he actually started off in a, in a church. He was a Presbyterian to begin with and then went through a whole gamut of things. And Joseph Smith was raised by Christian parents. By the way, Charles Taze Russell started the Jehovah's Witnesses. Joseph Smith started Mormonism. And then the Apostolic and the United Pentecostal Churches came out of the, um, uh, what do you call it, the Assemblies of God. Okay, So started in a Christian denomination. How did that happen? The enemy was attacking the truth in the church. Now, the Lord wants us to fight against these errors. He could stand up for himself. Certainly he could. And sometimes he does when he sends revival to purify the church. But even during times like that, the Lord always uses his people. He uses us. I mean, who better to fight for the truth than those who have been saved by the truth and those who love the truth, who know its power and who have his spirit. This is what the Lord calls us to do. He wants us to fight for it. He wants us to stand up for it. And that's why we've been looking at the fundamentals. Everything the Bible teaches is important. It's good. It's true. And we need to fight for all these truths. But the fundamentals are those things that are particularly important because our salvation depends upon them. And those are the things we have been looking at. Now, we've seen so far, the first fundamental is that the Bible is God's Word. It is inspired by God, literally breathed out by Him. It is His very Word. It has His full authority. It is the rule or the standard for what we are to believe and how we are to live. And we looked at all the reasons why we believe it is, but the main reason is the Spirit of God working in our hearts, convincing us that this is the truth. And so we're basing now everything else that we believe with regard to the fundamentals on what comes out of this book, because here God has spoken. Now, last week we considered who God is, and we considered it from the great confession of Israel, what's called the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And we noted that He is one God. There are not many gods, there's only one God. One unlimited being, unlimited with regard to His presence. And really, it's hard to conceive of that, but God is everywhere present with His whole being at the same time. He is so immense, He is infinite with regard to time. He is eternal, He has always existed. That's the reason why these things are here. Remember Jonathan Edwards, something exists now. Therefore, something has always existed because something cannot come from nothing. That which has always existed is God. He has always been. God has infinite power. He is almighty, infinite knowledge. He knows all things immediately. He doesn't learn anything, but he knows what's going to happen and he knows what could happen under any given set of circumstances. He is also perfect in holiness, his love for what is good, his justice, his goodness, and his truth. He's, for the more technically minded, he's without parts, right? He's, he's a simple being. If he were made up of parts, those parts would have to be finite parts, limited parts, which means you, you couldn't be infinite because you can't make up a, you can't make an infinite from a bunch of finite things. Also, it's been argued that if he was made up of parts, then who made him? Well, God isn't made. He is the creator. And also, he does not depend on anything. As we, as we look at the creation this morning and consider all that God made and how he made us and why he made us, we also need to understand he didn't have to do this because he needed us. It was his eternal purpose to do this. This was his plan, as it were, from all eternity which he's had from all eternity, but he doesn't need us. He is independent of us. We are dependent on him. We need him, but he does not need us. He also never suffers, but is perfectly blessed. And we saw that he is three in person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All the persons are called God. All have the attributes of God. All do the works of God. All are worshiped as God. And yet, they are clearly distinct 
persons, one God, three persons, the mystery of the Trinity, that is what is unique about the God who reveals himself in the Bible. Besides the fact he's the only one that actually exists. He is triune, one God in three persons. Now today let's consider the next fundamental, the creation and the fall. God created all things. The God created man, made man in his image. We're going to look at that this morning. And then this evening, that man fell away and is under God's judgment. So first of all, let's consider the creation of heaven and earth. Creation refers to what it is that God made. Everything that basically is made is everything that exists Besides God himself, besides God, everything else is a creation. Everything else is a creature. Now, as I've already mentioned, since God made everything, he has the right to do with what he has made what he wants. This this is really the fundamental principle of biblical Christianity. And, you know, the the implication of the fact that there is a creator and, and we are creatures, And that is that we are bound to serve him, to obey him, to submit to him, and that we are accountable to him. Now that is integral to the gospel. You know, we're all going to have to stand before God because we are his creatures and give an account. And the question is, how are we going to do it? Are we going to be able to do it standing in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his righteousness, with his forgiveness, which is alone acceptable to the Father? Or are we going to stand in our own, which is our unrighteousness and our sin? We have to give an account. Now, you know what? The enemy, as I've told you, tries to undermine all the truth of God. And here's another area where he attacks, another lie that he uses in the world and in the church to deny this accountability. And basically, we call it pantheism. You know, it comes basically from two Greek words. There's a word that's it's an adjective pas, which in the neuter is, is pan, we get the pan, pantheism, which means all or every. And then the word for God, which is theos, pan, pantheism or, or you know, the, the idea of pantheism means that all is God. It's essentially the belief that everything is God and God is everything. He is the creation. There really is no distinction between him and what he has made. He is the physical stuff of the universe. And essentially what they're saying then is that the universe is eternal. Nobody created it because it's always been and it is God. Some go further and say that this God who is everything is evolving. You know, he's in the process of of becoming He's not yet perfect, but he's on his way to perfection. And as he becomes, as he evolves toward perfection, things change. And that's essentially what is driving history along is God is basically working himself out. And as he does, wars take place, murder takes place, all these other things take, take place, which obviously is a blasphemous idea. But if this were true, If God was everything, that would mean also that we are God. At least we're a part of God because we're a part of the creation. Several years ago when we were having a Bible study, somebody, well, actually, I don't know whether somebody did this or whether I did this. I think I recorded um, one of Robert Shuler's Hour of Power, which thankfully I don't think is on the air any longer because it's pure heresy. But anyway, he was on, he he would ask somebody to come up and he would interview that person on his stage in front of thousands of people. And on this particular occasion, he had this man come up who was a philanthropist, who had billions of dollars that he was investing, and, Sh- and Schuler was smiling as he was talking about that, shaking his head and so forth. And then he asked, Schuler asked the man a question. He said, what do you think God is? And the man said, well, I think God is, is everything. Everything is God. And... Um, When we realize that that we are a part of God, you know, that we realize God is everything, we're just a small part of God, that is salvation. Well, that's pantheism. You know, what what should have happened there is if the Apostle Paul was on stage, he probably would have torn his garments and maybe pulled hair out of his head and, and yelled blasphemy, but instead 
Schuler basically nodded, smiled, thanked him, blessed him in the name of God, and sent him off the stage. Pantheism is in the church, you see, because Satan is trying to undermine the truth of God. But you see, if we were a part of God, if God were everything and we were a part of God, that means we should be worshipped. It also means that we would not be accountable to God because we wouldn't be creatures, would we? We would be divine. Have you ever heard that idea before? I mean, there's even those within the charismatic, well, maybe the more Pentecostal movement. Kenneth Copeland, right? He says, as a dog begets dogs and cat begets cats, God begets gods, you are all gods. I heard him say that one time on television, which is why I think we should stay away from the television when it comes to Christianity because there's so much error on the television. If that's true, we're not accountable to God. We're equal with God, and maybe we can hold Him accountable. You see, that the whole idea is blasphemous, but certainly if that were true, we would not need salvation. Now, creation means that we are creatures and we are, we are accountable to God, and that is fundamental to the gospel, and that's exactly what the Bible says. We are creatures. We are not the creator. We're not the masters of our own destiny. We are servants. We are stewards. We were made for a purpose. But that's exactly what God tells us in our text, in our passage. Now, we already read in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we're going to go over the creation really quickly so we can get to the creation of man. But the beginning... Is, is basically when time began. It's when God started the clock. It, it, it's basically when the clock started having something to measure, you see. There was no time until God made time. He dwells in eternity outside of time, which is beyond our comprehension. We are time-bound creatures. The beginning is when God created matter, when He created the heavens and the earth, all the stuff that's, that's, that's here. You know, there's something that exists now because something always existed. That something made all this matter. Now, here's another interesting thing to think about. If space is a created thing, because some believe that it's not necessarily created, but that space is actually God's being, you know, that's in Him we live and move and have our being. If it isn't God's being already, then He created space as well, okay? But it was the absolute beginning. Heaven was also created during this week, the place where God lives with his angels. We know that heaven is not an eternal place. We know that the angels are not eternal and they're not a part of an earlier creation that God made before this creation, but heaven and the angels are also a part of this creation. We know that the angels were actually created early on in the creation week because they were witnesses to the creation. In Job 38, verses 4 through 7, God asked Job this question. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? Or what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? Notice, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. See, God is telling Job basically here that when God ordered his creation, when he was arranging his creation, the angels were there rejoicing in the work that he was doing. They were created, first of all, to be an audience to the, to the power and majesty of God and his wisdom in creating all that he created. Now, after making a summary statement of the creations of the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1-1, Moses backs up to explain how God organized the material, the matter, that he created on the first day over a period of six days. Uh, and I was tempted to say this while I was reading through the text, but anyway, think about how God did it. First of all, he organized the environments. You know, if, you, if you're going to go out and get a pet, particularly one that needs its own environment, it's not going to live in your environment necessarily, but needs some special environment, like a reptile, uh, you first of all build a terrarium, don't you? And you, you put the materials in there that the reptile needs and you put the heat lamp in there because they're cold-blooded and they need this heat. So you set up the environment and then you bring the creature in and, and you put it in the terrarium. 
Well, God did the same thing here. He essentially created the space or the environments first when he uh, separates, as it were, the, you know, the waters. Well, he, he equates what on day one, the, uh, basically the heavens and the earth. And then he separates the waters and he creates the firmament or the skies. And then he separates the dry land from the waters and he creates the, basically all the environments. And on the next four or three days, excuse me, he fills up those environments with his creatures you know, the, the heavens with the sun, the moon, the planets, and the galaxies. The skies with the birds and the, the seas with the sea creatures and the land with the beasts and the creeping things. But then we get to the main point on the sixth day. He made man. Okay, he made us. Unlike most of the other creatures, I say most because there is one exception, he made us like him. He gave us certain powers, certain abilities that he has that the other creatures don't have, at least not to the degree that we do. He gave us the ability to think, the ability to reason so that we could think about him, so we could think his thoughts after him, so we could do what he made us to do. He gave to us something of his moral likeness, the, the power to love so that we could love him so that we could love what he loves, which is everything good and right, everything that is right for everyone, by giving us his Holy Spirit. And he gave us the ability to do things, not just to, you know, to have a body to carry these things out with, but he also gave us the ability to make plans and to carry those plans out. And as I've already mentioned, he also gave us the power to live forever. Now, the only other creatures that he made like this were the angels, okay? So that they could see his creative power and his glory in creation. But he also made them because he knew what he had planned for man. He knew there would be the fall, that man would turn against him. And he knew that there would be those he would save. And he knew that he was going to need those who would serve them. And so he created the angels to serve us. If you've ever asked the question, why are the angels so much greater in power than we are and knowledge and, and wisdom in, in many different ways? It's because God made them to serve us. And when one has greater power, one is then to serve those who have less power. Paul tells us in Romans 15 verse 1 that those who are stronger should serve those who are weaker. That's exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ did, didn't he? He was the Lord of glory who became a man, but he was still the greatest among men, God in human flesh. And yet he didn't come into the world to be served, but he came to serve. And that's why the angels were made, that they might serve us, serve him by serving us. Are they not all ministering spirits, the author to the Hebrews said, sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. Now again, we are the only other creatures that are made in the image of God and God made us in his image essentially for two reasons, so that we could know him, so that we could be in a relationship with him, so that we could be his sons and his daughters, so that we could love him and be loved by him. That's the first main reason and the second one is that we might glorify him by ruling creation under him and subduing that creation for his glory. Now here's where I want to reread our passage in Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You ever wonder why man's on top, at least, of the creatures? It's not because we're at the top of the evolutionary chain. It's because God made us like him and gave us authority over the creation. So then we read this, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We, male and female, we are made in the image of God because it's not our bodies that are made in the image of God. It is our soul that is made in his image. 
God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now let's just notice a couple of things from this passage. Notice first of all that this work of creating us in the image of God is a work of the triune God. Notice he says, let us. Now, we saw before that creation is the work of the three persons of the Godhead, remember? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father spoke, let it be. We call that divine fiat. The Son is the word that he spoke. I know that's kind of hard to understand, but that's essentially what John tells us in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. The Father speaks. The Son is the Word. And then the Spirit responded to the Word and made it happen. Genesis 1-2, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then the psalmist writes in Psalm 104, verse 30, You send forth your Spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. So all three are involved in the work of the creation in general, but all three are also involved in the work of our creation. He says, let us make man in our image. Now, we know he wasn't talking to the angels when he said that because the angels don't have creative power. You turn to your creatures and say, let us make man? No, because they can't do that. But in the counsel of the triune God, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, notice second, God was personally involved in our creation, unlike the creation of, of the other creatures. We read in Genesis 2, verse 7, then the Lord God formed man from the ground, or, or dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. As far as the other creatures are concerned, God said, let the earth bring forth, and the earth brought forth. But here, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, made, made his body, and then he breathed into this body a soul. Now, I want you to note from that one verse, we essentially see here that God did not use evolution to create us. Some people believe that God used the process of evolution. Not only is there no evidence for that position at all, period, no, no evidence in the fossil record, in anything that we have seen, zip, okay? But we see here in Scripture that man was man already when he began to live. He formed his body from the dust of the ground. He was a man but he was not alive. And then God put the breath of life into him and he became a living being. So he was a man before he became alive, as it were. He didn't evolve into a man and at some point God takes this evolved ape and puts a rational mind or a soul into it. That's not the way God did it. This man was not alive until he was already a man. But again, why the personal involvement? Why is it that God made us like Him? It was that we might know Him, be in relationship with Him, but it was also for these two other purposes, that we might rule the creation under Him. He says, let them rule. We saw in Psalm 8, verses 4 through 8, in our call to worship. What is man that you take thought of Him? And the son of man that you care for him. When I look at the vastness of your creation and how small and insignificant man is, why are you even involved in him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God and you crown him with glory and majesty. That is, in authority. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea whatever passes through the paths of the sea. So God made us like him that we might rule the creation under him. And in a certain sense, we're reflecting the image of God in ruling. Now, again, the fall made this a whole lot more difficult 
than it was before because now the creatures don't submit to us, do they? I mean, we can train animals. Uh, circus trainers are able to train ferocious tigers and so forth to respond to their commands. If you've been to the zoo, you've seen all the trained animals and so forth, but they don't automatically obey. And perhaps that would have been the case before the fall. And certainly many of them now are dangerous and they threaten us. And that wasn't the case before the fall, so things have changed. But we are still those who are on top of the food chain, even though sometimes the curse puts us on the bottom of the food chain. You know, whereas the plants are supposed to feed us, sometimes we feed the plants. As a matter of fact, eventually we're all going to feed the plants, aren't we? Because we're going to die and we're going to be buried in the ground. And those plants that were originally created for us, we become food for them. That's what the curse has done to us. It's killed us. But we'll see more about that this evening. And the second reason God made us in His image, or the third reason, I should say, is to know Him, to rule under Him, but it's also that we might subdue the earth, that we might study what He made, work with it, make it produce, make it yield what it's, what it's you know, capable of doing for the glory of God, because the creation has a lot of potential. I mean, can you imagine if, if we could transport Adam from the garden? into our present time, I mean, he'd be shocked by the immorality, that's one thing, but I think he would be amazed at what the earth has actually brought forth. I mean, he's looking at total agricultural society, nothing industrial yet, just plants, right? And yet we've got all this electrical stuff going on, all this circuitry, we've got this thing behind us, a projector and so forth. You know, who would have ever thought you could get a computer or an automobile out of the ground? And yet that's part of the earth's potential, and who knows what else it can yield. Now, man is still trying to make the earth yield certain things, but he's no longer doing it for the glory of God. We need to do this for the glory of God. Just think of what else might be possible. And then finally, there was the promise of additional help. God did not intend Adam and Eve to subdue the earth and rule it on their own. God gave them blessing, the blessing of procreation. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So there was going to be a great family that was going to do this work, a family of those who loved God and who wanted nothing more than to, to serve Him by doing what it is that He had called them to do. Now, let's just simply uh, close the topic this morning by reminding ourselves that this was the way that God originally made things to be. I mean, this is His original purpose. And what He made man to be is essentially what we see in the Lord Jesus Christ and what redemption brings us back to. But let's not forget, man did not stay in the garden very long. He did not have this fellowship with the Lord very long. God put him under a test, and he failed that test. That test was, a, was basically a test of pure obedience. But... You know, whether they would listen to God or whether they would listen to the devil, and they listened to the devil, they disobeyed God, and that plunged us all into ruin. Now, this evening we're going to consider that we, as mankind, failed that test. We brought the curse basically on ourselves and on all of creation, and we came under God's judgment. And, of course, being His creatures and not the Creator, not God's, being the creature, we are accountable to Him, which means we need a gospel. We need good news. We need a Savior. Now, we're not going to look at the Savior until next week. Uh, we are going to look at the fall this evening. But we do want to consider this morning, as we come to the table, what the Lord did to rectify the situation. He sent His Son into the world to become one with us, and to meet the qualifications for entry into heaven, which is perfect obedience. And then because we had sinned, he had to offer a sacrifice, but the only sacrifice that would do was a sacrifice from our nature. We owe the debt. We had to pay it. He paid it for us by laying down his life. And we know he also took it up again. He rose again from the dead. Our sins were laid on him. He died in our place. They put him in the grave. But his sacrifice paid for those sins. And the fact that he was raised from the dead means that God the Father accepted that payment. And now God the Father can show mercy to whoever he wants to show mercy because Jesus has paid the price. 
He's, he's given the obedience. He's died so that all who believe in him would not perish but have eternal life, would have that curse of the fall reversed and become a part of the new creation where you know, eventually the curse is going to be removed from the creation and everything is going to be made new again. And if you're trusting in Jesus, you'll be a part of that new creation. Well, that's essentially what the Lord's table reminds us of. Jesus tells us, do this in remembrance of me. Remember my love, my mercy, and my grace, my coming into the world, my laying down my life so that you might have life. So let's, uh, let's take just a moment and uh, let's, let's prepare. well, first of all, let's pray that the Lord would remind us that we are creatures and accountable to God. And let's, let's think about whether or not we are doing what the Lord would have us to do with our lives. But I also do want to read that passage this morning before we come to the table from 1 Corinthians 11. But we'll do that after we've, we've prayed. So let's first of all just pray.